A space for us. Un espacio para nosotras. Un espacio para nosotras. Do you remember 300,000 Ogoni people on the streets in 93 to end the ecological war which by the corporate greed? 3,000 oil spills, no reparations, and came the military. Crops were destroyed and petrol dollars, but killing gold police. We blocked the streets, demand accountability. Oh, can you hear our call? Shell must, shell must fall, oh shell must fall. Ogoni people not forgotten, shell must fall. They raped and tortured and murdered for oil. Ogoni people not forgotten, shell must fall. I started in 2003 as a Sunday activist. It's like an activist showing up to protests that other people organize um, against the war and the invasion in Iraq but I professionalized uh, my activist path in 2009 after going to the climate summit in uh, Copenhagen. And I learned about Bolivia's um, yeah, proposal for rights for Mother Earth, abolishing capitalism, climate debt, um, and this whole program really spoke to me. And it put me on a path to make a film about that and really in every fiber of my life incorporate that struggle. I think when it comes to inclusive civic power, I already have trouble with the word civic because it talks to civilian uh, status, which not everybody has. So when it comes to refugees, people without paper, um, they are excluded from that. So inclusive civic to me is a contradiction in terms. Uh, I would say let's make it people power. Um, and with people power, I think there are levels that you, it's okay to be local and there are levels of this fight where you really need that international solidarity to have that impact that you want and for that i think you need historical understanding that is aligned and political vision that is aligned so you can be different in your tactics or your you know certain elements of your strategy but you need to be aligned with your political vision and your historical understanding of the problem. And I feel often this is still lacking, that we operate on those um, level of symptoms uh, without a deep, deep relation to others um, addressing historical harm. I'm Bolivian Dutch with Quechua, um, a Quechua grandchild. Uh, my grandmother from my father's side is Quechua. And Um, to me, that means I have lifelong learning of re rekindling what has been lost. And the way that um, I think that I can do that is by taking the words of Alice Walker, the author, um, very seriously. She said, activism is how I pay rent for living on this earth. And so I think through activism, through organizing. It's not just about holding a protest sign, it's about organizing people, uh, collaborative. So you can learn how to restore a society, which is never an individual endeavor. There are things that you cannot do as an individual. And we're often told to take individual responsibility or, or think of ourselves as, I don't know, our consumer power or whatever. I don't believe in that. I believe in collective power So that's about building relationships um, and then having the courage to actually stop harm, getting harm's way. So um, a, a great example of that, I think, is, is Palestine action um, in the UK that actually, through civil disobedience, stopped an arms factory. They shut down an arms factory of Elbit. So that's like impossible sometimes for the mind to fathom that we, as as small beings can stop such violence, the production of violence through civil disobedience. Um, the rules aren't set up for us to create peace. So we have to change the rules. 
um, and that that takes a, a big political uh, dedication and a collective dedication. My activism for the longest time I've been the outsider and in the past three years I've become a huge insider and I'm still navigating that like how to be an outsider insider and how to sometimes take up a lot of space and how to sometimes really reject that space and, and, and again push other people forward or um, or just really recenter the collective uh, as the place where power comes from. Our biggest challenge of our times is the colonial crisis, colonial climate crisis, uh, the colonial crisis of inequality that ranks life uh, and sacrifices life. So I think the role of arts, uh, colonialism didn't just erode our, our material power, but also our um, knowledge power, our knowledge frames, our imagination frames. And I think liberation requires imagination. It requires us to think through the walls, to think through the, the frames that we have right now that are so narrow for our way of being. Um, so I don't think we're just material beings or mental beings. I think we're also spiritual beings and emotional beings. And art speaks the language of emotional truths. So when we can connect to the heart, um, it's, a, it's, it's like a highway to <laughs> alignment uh, that is sometimes hard when you just deal with the mental or the physical. Um, so for me, I just made an expo, Indigenous Dreams, which um, centers the dreams of nine Indigenous women living in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, it is thought that Indigenous people are either from the past or somewhere far away in the Amazon or in Australia, maybe. Um, but not here in the Netherlands right now. And so for us, it was very important to center their dreams as part of an antidote to the colonial nightmare, as part of a way of waking up from the colonial nightmare um, and the American dream. And yeah, I think I use songs. I use protest songs as well, like Shall Must Fall, um, which kind of reshifts the narrative from Shell is a company that pollutes a lot, it needs to stop polluting, to Shell is a company that sacrificed a lot of lives in Nigeria, in uh, Groningen, in Mapuche territory, in Argentina, and it actually needs to fall. So every time there's an article about our campaign, Shell must fall, they have to write, Shell must fall, says this and this. So you're making that affirmation that is actually unimaginable because such a big empire, how can it fall? Um, but we need repetition. So sometimes giving in your title uh, a, a little mind bomb um, that can set a whole different frame of being is our way of uh, building different relationships. It's the same for my people. So the Quechua people, if you Google it, you will get Quechua tents, Quechua bags, as an outdoor brand, um, which a lot of activists, including myself, also use a lot because it's like affordable and it uh, works. Um, but it's it's outrageous. Like a people of 11 million speakers is completely erased, and instead you get tents and and bags that kind of flirt with the notion of indigenous people are outdoor, are natural, are all these things, and it takes the shiny element of that connotation but then erases the entire people. And yeah, I think that's, in terms of cultural appropriation, there's a huge fight for who gets to, who gets to determine what decolonization means. Because if we leave it to the museums that all now want to decolonize, it's a very narrow scope of their decolonization. Um, sometimes they only talk about slavery, but not about uh, colonialism of indigenous people. Or sometimes they talk about it as a horrible thing that happened in the past, but not in the present. Um, so then the whole idea of eliminating borders never becomes a, a part of the program of decolonizing. Um, so that's a huge conflict of who gets to determine what these words mean. Um, and in climate justice, we also see this with loss and damage, um, who gets to determine the parameters of that. Uh, of what we've already lost and, and what that means in terms of reparations. A space for us. Un espacio para nosotras. Un espacio pour nous.